everyone, I'm Miss Mary Beth. I'm the Youth Services Librarian at Ingalls Memorial Library in Ringe. And I'm here today for Armchair Adventures. And that's our series where every day I read a little bit of a book to you and eventually we finish a whole book together. And the book we're reading right now is Peter Pan and Wendy by J.M. Barry. And this was first written in 1904 as a play and this was published in 1911 as a book. And do you know the story? You've maybe heard of Peter Pan before. But it's about Peter Pan, who's a boy who never grows up, and he lives in Neverland. And he goes to England, and he gets siblings, Wendy, John, and Michael. And the three of them, with Peter and Tinkerbell, the fairy, fly off to Neverland. And when they're in Neverland, they get into a lot of adventures. They fight with pirates, like Captain Hook. They have adventures with the native in Indians. They meet a bunch of wild beasts. They meet the mermaids. So every day... Wendy and all the Lost Boys, Peter's friends, and John and Michael, they have all these adventures. And Wendy's like the mom and she takes care of all of them, even though she's still a, girl, a little girl herself. So we were, when we left off the other day, we were about to start chapter 11, and Wendy was telling a story. And it's called Wendy's Story. Are you ready? Okay. Listen then, said Wendy, settling down to her story, with Michael at her feet and seven boys in the bed. There was once a gentleman... I'd rather he had been a lady, Curly said. I wish he had been a white rat, said Nibs. Quiet, Wendy admonished them. There was a lady also, and... Oh, Mom, cried the first twin. Do you mean that there's a lady also, don't you? <gasps> She's not dead, is she? Oh, no, said Wendy. I'm awfully glad she isn't dead, said Toodles. Are you glad, John? Of course I am. Are you glad, Nibs? Rather. Are you glad she's not dead, twins? We are just glad. Oh, dear, sighed Wendy. Little less noise there, Peter called out, determined that she should have fair play, however beastly a story it might be in his opinion. The gentleman's name, Wendy continued, was Mr. Darling, and his lady's name was Mrs. Darling. Those are their parents, right? I knew them, said John, to annoy the others. I think I knew them, said Michael, rather doubtfully. John and Michael are beginning to forget their parents. They were married, you know, explained Wendy. And what do you think they had? White rats, cried Nibs, inspired. No, said Wendy. Oh, it's awfully puzzling, said Toodles, who knew the story by heart. Quiet, Toodles. They had three descendants. What is descendants? Well, you are one, twin. Did you hear that, John? I am a descendant. Descendants are only children, said John. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, sighed Wendy. Now, these three children had a faithful nurse called Nana. But Mr. Darling was angry with her and chained her up in the yard. And so all the children flew away. It is an awfully good story, said Nibs. They flew away, Wendy continued, to the Neverland, where the lost children are. I just thought they did, Curly broke in excitedly. I don't know how it is, but I just thought they did. Oh, Wendy, cried Toodles. Was one of the lost children called Toodles? Yes, he was. I am in a story. Hurrah! I am in a story, Nibs. Hush. Now, I want you to consider the feelings of the unhappy parents with all their, tr their children flown away. Oh, they all moaned. Though they were not really considering the feelings of the unhappy parents one bit. Think of all the empty beds. Oof, it's awfully sad, said the first twin. I don't see how it can have a happy ending, said the second twin. Do you, Nibs? I'm frightfully anxious. If you knew how great is a mother's love, Wendy told them triumphantly, you would have no fear. She had now come to the part that Peter hated. I do like a mother's love, said Toodles, hitting Nibs with a pillow. Do you like a mother's love, Nibs? I do just, said Nibs, hitting back. You see, said Wendy complacently, our heroine knew that the mother would always leave the window open for her children to fly back by, so they stayed away for years, and they had a lovely time. Did they ever go back? Let us now, said Wendy, bracing herself for her finest effort. Let's take a peep into the future. And they all gave themselves the twist that makes peeps into the future easier. Years have rolled by, and who is this elegant lady of uncertain age alighting at London Station? <gasps> oh, Wendy, who is she? cried Nibs every bit as excited as if he didn't know the end of the story. Can it be? Yes, it is. It's the fair Wendy. Oh, 
And who are the noble portly figures accompanying her, now grown to a man's size? Can they be John and Michael? Oh, they are! Oh! See, dear brothers, says Wendy, pointing upwards. There is the window still standing open. Ah, now we are rewarded for our sublime faith in a mother's love. So they flew up to their mummy and daddy, and a pen cannot describe the happy scene over which we draw a curtain. That was the story, and they were as pleased with it as the fair narrator herself. Everything was just as it should be, you see. Off we skipped like the most heartless things in the world, which is what children are, but so attractive, and we have an entirely selfish time. And then, when we have need of special attention, we nobly return for it, confident that we will be embraced instead of smacked. So great indeed was their faith in a mother's love that they felt they could afford to be callous for a bit longer. But there was one who knew better, and when Wendy finished, he uttered a hollow groan. Ugh. What is it, Peter? she cried, running to him, thinking he was ill. She felt him solicit solicitously, lower down than his chest. Where is it, Peter? It isn't that kind of pain, Peter replied darkly. Then what is it? asked Wendy. Wendy, you are wrong about mothers, he said. They all gathered round him in a fright. So alarming was his ag agitation, and with a fine candor he told them that he had hitherto what he had hitherto concealed. Long ago, said Peter. I thought, like you, that my mother would always keep the window open for me. So I stayed away for moons and moons and moons, and then flew back. But the window was barred, for mother had forgotten all about me, and there was another little boy sleeping in my bed. I am not sure that this was true, but Peter thought it was, and it scared the boys. Are you sure mothers are like that? they all asked. Yes, said Peter. So this was the truth about mothers. The toads! Still, it is best to be careful, and no one knows so quickly as a child when he should give in. Wendy, let us go home, cried John and Michael together. Yes, she said, clutching them. Not tonight, asked the lost boys, very bewildered. They knew in what they called their hearts that no one could get on quite well without a mother, and that is only the mothers who think they can't, who think you can't. At once, Wendy replied resolutely, for the horrible thought had come to her. Perhaps mother is in half mourning by this time. This dread made her forgetful of what must be Peter's feelings, and she said to him rather sharply, Peter, will you make the necessary arrangements? If you wish it, he replied, as coolly as if she had asked him to pass the nuts. Not so much as a sorry to lose you between them. If she did not mind the parting he was going to show her, was Peter, that neither did he. But of course he cared very much, and he was so full of wrath against grown-ups, who, as usual, were spoiling everything, that as soon as he got inside his tree, he breathed intentionally quick, short breaths at the rate of five to a second. <laughs> he did this because there is a saying in the Neverland that every time you breathe, a grown-up dies. <gasps> and Peter was killing them off vindictively. Oh my goodness. He does not like grown-ups, does he? Then, having given the necessary instructions to the native of the natives, he returned to the home, where an unworthy scene had been enacted in his absence. Panic-stricken at the thought of losing Wendy, the lost boys had advanced upon her threateningly. It will be worse than before she came, they cried. We shan't let her go. Let's keep her prisoner. Ay, chain her up. In their extremity, an instinct told her which of them to run, which of them to turn. Toodles, she cried. I appeal to you. Was it not strange? She appealed to Tootles, quite the silliest one. Grandly, however, Tootles did respond. For that one moment, he dropped his silliness and spoke with dignity. I am just Tootles, he said, and nobody minds me. But the first who does not behave to Wendy like the English gentleman, I will blood him severely. He drew his hanger, and for that instance, the sun was at noon. The others held back uneasily. Then Peter returned, and they saw at once that they could, would get no support from him. He would keep no girl in Neverland against her will. Wendy, he said, striding up and down, I have asked the natives to guide you through the wood, as flying tires you so. Thank you, Peter. Then, he continued, in the short, short, sharp voice of one accustomed to be obeyed, Tinkerbell will take you across the sea. Wake her, Nibs. Nibs had to knock twice before he got an answer, though Tink had really been sitting up in bed listening for some time. Who are you? How dare you? Go away! She cried. You are to get up, Tink, Nibs called, and take Wendy on a journey. 
Of course, Tink had been delighted to hear that Wendy was going, but she jolly well determined was she did not want to be her courier, and she said so in still more offensive language. Then she pretended to be asleep again. She says she won't do it, Nibs exclaimed, aghast at such insubordination, whereupon Peter went, Peter went sternly toward the young lady's chamber. Tink, if you do not get up and dress at once, I will open the curtains, and we shall see you in your pajamas. This made her leap to the floor. Who said I wasn't getting up? She said. In the meantime, the boys were gazing forlornly at Wendy, now equipped with John and Michael for the journey. By this time, they were dejected, not merely because they were about to lose her, but also because they felt that she was going off to something nice to which they had not been invited. Novelty was beckoning to them, as usual, crediting them with a nobler feeling, Wendy melted. Dear ones, she said, if you will all come with me, I feel almost sure I can get my father and mother to adopt you. The invitation was meant specially for Peter, but each of the boys was thinking exclusively of himself, and at once they jumped with joy. But won't they think us all rather a handful? asked Nibs in the middle of his jump. Oh no, said Wendy, rapidly thinking it out. It will only mean having a few beds in the drawing room. They can be hidden behind screens on the first Thursdays. Peter, can we go? they all cried imploringly. They took it for granted that if they went, he would go also. But really, they scarcely cared. The children are ev thus children are ever ready when novelty knocks to desert their dearest ones. Oh no. All right, Peter replied with a bitter smile, and immediately they rushed to get their things. And now, Peter, Wendy said, thinking she had put everything right, I'm going to give you your medicine before you go. She loved to give them medicine and undoubtedly gave them too much. Of course, it was only water. But it was out of a calabash, and she always shook it and counted the drops, which gave it a certain medicinal quality. On this occasion, however, she did not give Peter his drop, for just as she had prepared it, she took a, she saw a look on his face that made her heart sink. Get your things, Peter, she cried, shaking. No, he answered, pretending indifference. I'm not going with you, Wendy. Yes, Peter. No. To show her that her departure would leave him unmoved, he skipped up and down the room, playing gaily on his heartless pipes. She had to run about after him, though it was rather undignified. To find your mother, let's go, she coaxed. Now, if Peter had ever quite had a mother, he no longer missed her. He could do very well without one. He had thought them out and remembered their, only their bad points. No, no, he told Wendy decisively. Perhaps she would say I was old, and I, I just always want to be a little boy and to have fun. But Peter, no. And so the others had to be told, Peter isn't coming. Peter not coming? They gazed blankly at him, their sticks over their backs, and each on each stick a bundle. Their first thought was that if Peter was not going, he had probably changed his mind about letting them go. But he was far too proud for that. If you find your mothers, he said, I hope you will like them. The awful cynicism of this made an uncomfortable impression, and most of them began to look rather doubtful. After all, their faces said, were they not noodles to want to go? Now then, cried Peter, no fuss, no blubbering. Goodbye, Wendy. And he held out his hand cheerily, quite as if they must really go now, for he had something important to do. She had to take his hand, as there, were no, there was no indication that he would prefer a thimble. You will remember about changing your flannels, Peter, she said, lingering over him. She was always so particular about their flannels. Yes. And you will take your medicine? Yes. That seemed to be everything, and an awkward pause followed. Peter, however, was not the kind that breaks down before people. Are you ready, Tinkerbell? He called out. Aye, aye. Then lead the way. Tink darted up the nearest tree, but no one followed her, for it was at this moment that the pirates made their dreadful attack upon the Native Americans. Above, where all had been so still, the air was rent with shrieks and a clash of steel. Below, there was dead silence. Mouths remained opened and remained open. Wendy fell on her knees, but her arms were extended toward Peter. All arms were extended towards him, as if suddenly blown in his direction. They were beseeching him mutely not to desert them. As for Peter, he seized his sword, the same thought he had slain Barbecue with, and the lust of battle was in his eye. That is the end of chapter 11. <gasps> I, I wonder if Wendy and Michael are gonna, and John are going to be able to go. I hope their parents don't forget about them. I don't think that's possible.
I don't know. You'll have to join me tomorrow to find out. But before we go, I have to tell you the code word. Have you signed up for your Read Squared Summer Reading account? Have you been watching these? <gasps> if you have, then you get a raffle ticket. So today's code word is mother. Do you have it? Mother. Remember that code word, okay? Log on to your Read Squared account or create an account. Go to ingleslibrary.com under the Children and Teens page and you can find it. All the information about Read Squared. And log in your code word and then you get a raffle ticket. So thanks for reading with me. Join us tomorrow to find out what happens. We're almost done. I think we'll finish soon. Thanks for reading with me. Have a fun day.